Okay, so we've got a basic set out for the um, setbacks there. But this is just showing the driveway. And I want to make that a little bit bigger so that we know it complies with the uh, fire separation. So, so I'm going to make that six metres. Uh, exactly, it's close to that anyway. And this one um, is, is more than enough as it is. Uh, and I'm also just going to check the distance between those two reference planes. It's probably not, this is going to be the footprint of the, the building. It's probably not a bad idea to make that a, a round number now, and I might uh, reduce that um, so that it's a bit less on the left-hand side, and maybe try, well, I think even 32,000 would be nice. It would be something like that. You can always extend it later if you need more room, but uh, I think that would work pretty well. And so, of course, I've got the setback from President Avenue here just at um, 7 metres. You can, of course, increase that. And then the rear is uh, set back from there at the moment, um, 68 metres, and I might reduce that as well. So let's make it exactly 68,000. So that'll give me the basis for my pad. Of course, you need the levels set up in advance. Don't worry too much about the exact values for those because you can massage those as you uh, modelling. Um, the pad, of course, is going to be hosted by this lower level. So I've got car park 2 there at 9,000. So I'm going to just open that view. Even though we can't see those elements, I can simply go to massing and site and then building pad so that it's hosted by that level and then return to my site drawing and continue making my lines there, if I use pick lines and pick the reference planes that I've just adjusted. So I think a lot of you have done this already. Have most of you made your pads to sit into your topo surface for your car park? Yeah. I thought a lot of you had what about the ramps? Have many of you started to make your ramps yet? Or made a ramp? So I'm just going to finish that, and then maybe we'll check it in the 3D view, and you can see then that we've got, obviously, the pad cutting away that part of the site, which really I've just done so that when I make the first ramp, we can see it in 3D. Uh, but you can see then also that the trees are going down with that. So any trees that are within the building footprint will need to be removed. Uh, because the trees are hosted by the topo surface, and the topo surface, of course, has gone down. So, do you know what you would do in, uh, in definitely most firms using Revit for their professional work? Uh, if you have something like this that's being added to an existing site, do you know the tool in Revit that lets you manage existing and new work? You might have come across it. Exactly, phases. So we're not going to require you to use phases for this project because you don't need to produce detailed as existing drawings. There's really no building there anyway, so the site analysis plan you've done will be enough to show uh, what's existing on the site. But it's really important that you then keep a copy of that file uh, separate to the one you're going to modify because you're going to add in your proposal without using phases. Okay, so... Again, if you're using this uh, for um, professional work uh, with a firm that's, been, that's got some experience with Revit, not all of them use phases, but I think most would or should, uh, you'll see on the Manage tab, you've got options there for phases. But that isn't all you need to know. If you do want to experiment with phases, I recommend just experimenting to begin with. They're a bit tricky to work with. Um, so don't... Uh, make a decision just to use it with this project before you know how to use them. Just click on that to show you. You here can see the phases that are uh, already set up for you, and often they're the only ones you need, but then you've got phase filters there. 
which are important as well. But what you will also need to know about phases is that there's a phase property associated with each view. So you'll see here, so I thought you might have noticed this one, phase options down there at the bottom of each view property, and then also each object has a phase property. So every object in Revit, you'll see, if you go down the bottom, has a phase created and a phase demolished property. So I'd highly recommend you investigate phases. They're a really useful um, option, and uh, I use them for my own projects. But again, it takes a bit of getting used to. So for this project, what you should be doing is, once you've started to make changes that are part of your new building, um, and uh, you're going to need to show the existing in another file, uh, save the project, save as, with a new name, so I'll call this Faculty Building Proposed. And then you'll need to have the other file with your as existing drawings. So that's really important because you don't want to lose all that work you've done. Here now I can delete these trees from that part. And that's the only way you can do it. Otherwise, I mean, you could hide them. I suppose that's another option. We need to hide them in all of views. And um, it's probably just as much work as having a separate file. But again, the proper way is to use phases. It's just going to be, uh, you know, I think, too difficult to do if you haven't done it before. Uh, so then the ramp, I can now go and look at in um, this car park level. So back on the architecture tab, I'm just going to uh, straight away go to the ramp tool. And so do you remember the gradients that you'll need for your transition? Or has anyone worked, tried to work it out? I know that no one looked at the um, standard for the off street car parking because the document expired and no one realised. Uh, so I've renewed it. There's, I've put a version there again that's, uh, that you can open. But, uh, but again, yeah, no one told me about that. So again, in Australian standards there, you'll see that off street parking standard. It's really important that you start to read these documents to understand the controls. I think you've gone through that one with George. Oh, good, George yeah. Lucas. I think you both went through it last name with George. Yeah. But for the domestic stuff. Yeah, sure. Same standard, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and so then, um, what is it, section... Uh, I've always got to look at this. Um, section 2, I think, isn't it? And then, yeah, so, railways and ramps. And so, yeah, so doing domestic... Uh, driveways, what was the minimum, what's the gradient? One in eight, transition. Transition, yeah, and then what's the main gradient? Four. One in four, and so for this one, what's it going to be? So this isn't a private ramp, it's a public, so it's not one in four. So there's a different control, okay, it tells you here. There we are. So section 2.5.3, part B, oh, sorry, not part B. Uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, part B, uh, clause 2, also oh, clause 1. And, um, oh, no, sorry, one longer than 20 metres, sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, I thought it was for all resident... Oh, no, so yeah, that's private or residential car parks. Um, I'll double-check where the other thing is. Oh, here we are. This is it. Uh, up to 20, 20 metres long for straight ramps in public car parks. There we are. So definitely one in five. I knew this up. Yep. And then... Um, OK, so that's going to mean your transitions will be different as well. They can't be one in eight. So what does the transition have to be? Transition between one in five and flat. Anyone want to be brave and have a guess? Exactly, yeah, 1 in 10, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, those are our gradients. All right, so to work that out with the ramp tool in Revit, it's going to go to ramp, edit type, duplicate, and we're going to call this ramp 
transition. Car park. And then if you scroll down, you'll see you have the slope there, the maximum slope. And we just need to change that to 10. So that represents 1 and 1 over 10. And then uh, click OK. Looking at the standard again, you'll see the maximum length is... Uh, I'm not even going to look for it. I know it's 2 metres. So... I'm like, there are no 2 metres. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And so... OK, so then I'm just going to click somewhere. We're on the basement level. Uh, sorry, on the car park level. So it's going to click. And then... Uh, I didn't worry about the width, but I'll modify that in a minute. I'm just going to make that 2 metres long. can modify the width afterwards. So I'll make that uh, for now. I'm not too worried about this because we're going to change it later anyway. Make it say, uh, look at two metres on the side of the centre line. Okay, so if I look at that now in section, that will tell me, I mean, you should be able to work this out in your head anyway, but in section you will see the height of that ramp, which is our first transition. Oops, I'm just going to draw a section quickly through there. I've got another one to the side anyway, but this one will still be useful. And we'll bring that view range out so that you can see the first ramp there. And if you aren't sure that you can get the calculation right in your head, you can always measure that. And you can see then that's going to be 200. So that will be the start point for the next ramp. Okay, so back to car park one. So you just do them as, as sections with the ramps? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just do three ramps. And, yeah. yep. uh, and so now with the ramp tool again, this time I'll make it uh, four metres wide. May not be that wide in the end, but that's all right for now. And so then the base offset, oops, base offset will make 200. Top offset will be minus 200. And I'm going to make sure that my top level is, uh, well, it may not actually be ground floor. And uh, I haven't made a level for the ground line at the entry, so I'll, I'll just make that ground floor for now, but that may change. Uh, this is just indicative, so we've got an idea how long the ramp needs to be when we're planning the um, car parking level. So you go edit type and duplicate the ramp again. And this will be ramp main car park. And there I can make the gradient or the slope 5. And then the incline length 12 metres, that should be that should be enough. I'll make sure of that in a moment. Actually it might not be enough. So I'm going to go back to edit type. And just in case, I'll make that 15 metres. Shouldn't be any longer than that. And then just back to run with straight line. I can snap to the centre of this um, previous ramp. And then just take it uh, as far as it needs to go. So yeah, that's right, as far as it needs to go because I've got the top offset there. So that should be, that should be right. Make sure my maths is right there. Tick to finish. Yeah, not long enough, so maybe it doesn't need to be more than 15 metres. Let's have a look. Yeah, it's got to be more than... Oh, no. No, it's gone, more, gone too far, sorry. So, OK, so I've got to do a bit of calculation. I was hoping to avoid that. So the distance between my levels is... 3 metres. And so with the calculator... We've got 3 metres minus 400, 200 from the top and the bottom, gives us 2.6 metres that we need to rise. That, that level you've got, you've already put that level in as where it's going to the top of your ramp. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah. The copy level, right? uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, it's just, yeah, it's just the ground floor level that I had previously. Oh, okay. Um, Is that only your base level that you've gone over? Not your ground level? Uh, no, well, my base level is... Um, is there for some of the things on the site, but it's probably not going to be my entry level. 
So I'll need to make another level for that. And so the ramp in the end probably will be, won't be as high as I'm doing it now, but this is to take it to the ground floor. Um, and the ramp on the, on the level below will be the same height because from the uh, car park one to ground floor is three metres and from car park two to car park one is also three metres. So this is really just to get an idea um, how big, big the ramps will be generally. And so, again, so 2.6 metres is the rise. So multiply that by 5, and we've got the length, so 13 metres is what it should be. So, yep, yeah, so Revit lets you draw a ramp longer than what you need to get to the next level. So I'm just going to go back to Edit Sketch and bring that back to 13,000. Drag the slope there. Doesn't hurt. The, uh, sorry, the uh, run line. So again, tick to finish. And I'll just move that all back now using the arrows on the keyboard. And now back to the um, ramp tool for the final transition. So I can just change the type there to ramp tran uh, transition, ca transition car park and change the um, uh, base level. I'll make uh, the ground floor for now. And then the base offset, I'll make minus 200. And then the top level, I'll also make ground floor, but with the top offset set to zero. And then click to the midpoint of that ramp and then just make it two metres long. There we go. So now in my section, what's happened there? I've miscalculated this in some way. Oh yeah, so I did have my base level three metres and I've done, so I've done my ground floor too high. Okay, so I'll need to bring my car parks up. Um, that's okay. And that's actually the great thing about Revit. It is really easy to adjust levels, uh, which you'll constantly need to change, and uh, objects, if they're hosted properly, will go with them. So the error I've made is a, uh, it's one metre off. The car park should be three metres below the ground floor, not three metres below the base level. So I can simply move those two car park levels up a thousand and that will correct my ramp as well as other things and you can see that turned perfectly. And then probably not going to need the railings on those ramps so you can just delete those for now. Uh, you can look at using uh, probably the wall tool to do barriers um, for those, if you're going to do concrete, it's easier just to do a uh, wall profile or something like that. And maybe it wouldn't hurt to have a floor for that car park level, just so that the um, ramp is sitting on something. And so, again, I can start the floor in the uh, floor plan associated with that level and then switch to the site plan where I have my reference planes showing that give me the setbacks. Just pick those, join them, show you what I'm sort of thing for. Tick to finish and then again, it's funny the way shadows work with things like this, but uh, we're not going to show shadows in the end with those anyway, so that doesn't matter. And uh, so there we are, so you can see the ramp there perfectly attaching to the floor. So I think with this one, it, it just happened that the top of the ramp happened to be the same as the floor level, as, as opposed to being sort of like a site level. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, well I'd have to adjust. So, so, the, um, so this ramp will be um, exactly like this on the level below, because it's got that three metre height difference. Okay. But then once I establish the height I'm going to have for that entry, um, so... Uh, you know, coming up from the road level there, yeah. I suppose it'll maybe slope up slightly and then, uh, yeah, so once I've got that, I'll make a level for it and just attach the ramp to that. Oh, okay. I probably need to change that, um, the length of that, that main ramp a little bit. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, so actually you could easily copy that and um, what I might do before that is just look at the graphics there. You can see it shows this down arrow. Uh, so that's an American thing. You don't want down arrows ever and you generally don't need the labels either so you've got this option they've given for people who don't follow that convention show up arrow 
in all views, which of course you should use for all of your stairs as well. And then it will give you the uh, up text though, of course, and it's good to change these before you start copying this because it's an instance property, so it, you can't just change it in the type property, so I can just turn the labels off there. And then, even then, getting the arrows to show up can be a bit fiddly. And I'll show you there are some other options you can use for that as well. Uh, so then I'm going to just use copy to clipboard and then paste uh, a line to selected levels and choose car park 2. And then have a look in the section to make sure that has attached properly because yeah, sometimes the offsets will be different. So there you can see it has uh, it's kept the uh, heights or the, the gradients in relation to the other parts, and you can actually just use the move tool here to bring that up. Uh, in some cases, actually, that's not working because they're grouped, but it's the offset. So here you can see, I just need to go through and check the levels there. So the base level, but this could be uh, car park one with the base offset minus 200 and the top offset zero, uh, and the top level again, car park one. Next one, uh, base offset. 200 and top offset uh, minus 200 from car park 1 and then the other bit of ramp down there again uh, base offset, oh sorry, base level car park 2 base offset 0 and then uh, top level car park 1 uh, sorry, it doesn't really matter what the top level is actually top level could be car park 2 with a top offset of 200 if you like but doesn't really matter either way. Uh, so, again, looking at the plan now for that level. So that'll definitely be the size of the ramp for that level. The other one will probably be slightly shorter once you know the height of the entry. But that will help you a lot so you know how much room the ramp's going to take up in your car park and then you can work out your um, uh, car park layouts. And then just going a bit further with the massing, now that we've cut out the topo surface. Is there much difference on the curve if you do a curved ramp or it just goes from the centre line of the ramp? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and exactly the same otherwise, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, so what I might do there is make a view, and uh, I'll do it in the same video. It'll be a long video, but um, so you just need to. Uh, look at the ramps um, first if you haven't done those before but then you can otherwise skip to the uh, massing later if you want to go over this. So I'm going to duplicate the 3D view and then rename it and call it uh, 3D massing and I'm actually going to hide a few of those things I've just made because I want to do a mass for the whole car park. So I'm just going to hide the elements in that view, the, um, the floor, I've just selected, I'm going to go hide and view elements. And I may even end up hiding the ramps, but they're not really going to be too much in the way there. Um, so then I'm going to make, like I said, a mass for the whole car park. So I'm massing in sight. And then, well, do you remember the way I showed you to make a mass last time? Using the menu. So, so I know you've made some families before um, from the menu, which means, again, that they're loadable families. So if you go new family, you're making a family in a separate file. And it's the same if you choose conceptual mass from the menu there, you're making a mass family in a separate file. But if you go to in place mass, it's the same as model in place. So you're making a mass family, but it's a unique one off family, like any in place family, and it's part of your project file. So you can make a mass either way, just the same as a regular family. So if you go to in place mass, You'll see it'll tell you that it's going to turn the show mass mode on 
you can toggle that yourself with the button there that's the first option on that massing and site toolbar. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then we've got a name for the mass. So this will be um, car park. And then you have the same um, drawing tools that you get with the mass family. But do you remember how it looked when we looked at making a mass family? What the display had? It wasn't like... Yeah, you have those, those gizmos, but in the 3D views as well, you had that different, that gradient background, and you could see the planes in 3D. So that's the difference. When you use an in-place mass, you don't get those extra graphics options that you get when you make a mass family. Uh, and they're useful. So if you need to make a more complex mass family with lots of different planes and things like that, it's still better to do it in a separate file because you get the graphics uh, for those 3D things that we won't get here. Otherwise, though, you have all the same options for creating a mass. So you've got here your draw pattern. And so I'm going to simply draw some lines tracing my pad. And so you can see, unlike a lot of things in Revit, it will snap automatically to things in 3D. And I can even set it to a particular plane. It's picked it up automatically, level 01 car park 2. But if you want to force it, you can choose the plane there. So then I'm going to simply draw lines. Again, um, I can either trace the, the pad, or I could also use pick lines here and pick the... Um, pick the surface um, edges, and by using tab, you should be able to get those in one hit, which is what I've just done there. So I've basically just got a rectangle following my pad shape, and then I can select that, and then go to create form, and it will give me a simple extrusion, uh, which I can then change to the height of the uh, car park, which is going to be 6 metres. So you can see, well before I do all the modelling that I need for the, um, uh, for the physical elements, the walls, floors and, and ceilings and so on, I've got a good idea then how that car park is going to sit into the site. You can see straight away that we need to do some cut and fill. Uh, so we'll need retaining walls there if we're going to have the um, car park set down. Uh, so retaining walls on the ground floor level, I mean, if we're going to have the car park set down into the site like that, we could lift the car park up and then maybe uh, have part of it exposed down here. And these are the options you've got to think about when you're establishing your building volume. So that's one mass. And you've got then a couple of options from this point. I could either add the other building elements as part of this mass family, or I can finish this one and make a new mass family for those things. And, and for something like a car park, it probably is sensible to have that as a separate mass because that's going to be a defined shape that um, will work independently of the um, upper part of the building, so that's OK to keep it separate. So back to massing and site. I'm going to click on this toggle here just so you can see that will toggle the massing on and off. But I'm going to make another view. Again, duplicate view and duplicate. Don't need to use detailing here. And then I'll call this one 3D massing only. And what I'm going to do there is go to visibility graphics, click edit, and turn off all of these categories just by selecting the first one, holding down shift and selecting the last one before mass, turning them off, turn mass on, and then go down and do the same thing with all of the categories below the mass. So now I've got a view where I only see the massing elements. And the toggle there won't do anything. The massing will stay on always. Uh, so that's a very simple mass, but I'll do something similar for the next level. So again, back to in-place mass. And we'll call this... Uh, main building. And then again, using the line tool, I'll do a footprint and I'm going to refine this shape 
as I go, but for now I just want to get an idea of the maximum volume of the ground floor level. So again, with the draw on work plane option selected, I can choose my placement plane and set it to ground floor. And let's just have a look at the brief. You should all remember the, the heights by now because you've probably just done them in your report, but we'll um, just open that up anyway. Right. So ground floor should be five metres from memory, but uh, I'll just make sure of that. I'm sure I said uh, five metres. Trying to remember where that is. Oh, yeah, sorry, here we are. Five metres floor, uh, uh, floor to ceiling level, actually. That should be floor to floor. Shouldn't it? Is that enough? Is it going to be a metre? No, no. So, yeah, floor to floor. Yeah, floor to floor. I think that would be plenty, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so we'll come back to the other levels. And again, this is adjustable, the whole point of doing the massing is we can work this out. So uh, again, just with, um, okay, so with pick lines, I can pick the, uh, the mass from the level below. And then again, click create form. And now using that dimension, change the, the height to uh, five metres. And then continue making additional mass elements for each level. It's up to you. You might break it up then according to function, but uh, and, and the levels are essentially divided that way anyway. So there'll be entry, and then you'll have um, teaching levels above, and so so that's uh, automatically going to be uh, breaking them up according to their function as well as the levels. So so here I'll make uh, another mass. Oh, so I was a bit doing that a bit too quickly. Uh, so another mass for the uh, next story. Ah, oh, what's happened there? But that's it. So using pick lines there, it will pick the top, but it doesn't hurt to also choose the level, just to make sure it knows um, where the line should go. So again, just tab if you want to pick all of those edges together and then again select that shape use create form and then put in the height for uh, this next level which could be uh, 4 or 5 so again looking at the brief there typical levels are going to be 4 but you need to have one that's 5 so maybe I'll make this one 4,000, and then I'll do the next one 5. So again, pick lines, and again, this time I'll choose the level before picking, and just using tab to pick those lines quickly, and again, choose this shape for create form, and this one will be my 5 metres. So those are the, the main levels. And then remember you've got your roof terrace, which will have the, um, the cafe. And you could just use a simple extrusion, but I thought I'd show you if you want to make forms that aren't based on, the, um, on planes parallel to the ground, if you want to start drawing things in an elevational plane or plane perpendicular to the ground, uh, it's fairly easy. Now that I've got some surfaces that are perpendicular, I can go back to the line tool. And this time, I'm going to change to draw on face. And then you'll see it will highlight these surfaces that I've already created as I hover over them. So I'm going to start on that edge, but make sure that it's highlighting the plane on the side, not the plane on the top. Okay, so I might, uh, again, just zoom in there towards the front of the building and, again, making sure I'm highlighting the plane on the side. And then it's going to come up 
And uh, so I'm going to try and do a, a sloping shape. So I'm going to make that, uh, for now, maybe, I think, three metres should be plenty there. So 3,000, enter. And now I'm going to come across to the right and uh, just get a straight line there. I'm not too worried about this dimension. And now I'm going to do my angle. So I've just come back down to the edge there and I'm going to close the shape. So remember, when you're using the massing tools, it automatically joins the lines for you. So unlike sketch mode uh, with most of the other tools, where the lines will always be separate, Revit's making decisions here about how these lines should be joined. So those are all connected shapes. And so I can see there, well, that's enough for the um, functional requirements. I've got enough for the ceiling part that I need. But maybe the form there doesn't quite work with the volumes I've done previously. So I want to go and adjust this now. So I'm going to select that shape and then to select one of the individual segments, the easiest way is just to click again on the one you want to adjust. And then you can use all the regular options to adjust these. You can use the arrows on the keyboard or you can type in a new dimension. So same here, I can bring that line back. And, of course, I can move the whole shape forward if I select that um, as a group. And then, using the arrows on the keyboard, I can just nudge that. Okay, so it's good to get the shape uh, as close as you can to what you're after before turning it into 3D. Because once you turn it into 3D, it's harder to go back to the profile. But you can. I'll show you how to get back to the profile in a minute. So I'm just going to select that shape now and then go to Create Form. And it's going to extrude it to the side. It doesn't matter which direction, because I can use the arrows there to drag it in the direction I want. Okay, so that's one way of getting a sloping surface. Um, can you make a curve using that? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. So, you, so you wanted to extrude following the curve, is that the idea? Yeah, okay, so to do that, um, yeah, I'll just come up with one here. So. Okay, so I'm going to go and draw a, a profile over here. And, well, actually, if you want to draw one that's not based on a surface that you already have, it'll help you a lot if you make reference planes, just like regular modelling. Uh, and so make sure you know there, with, with the options you have here, you've got model, reference, and then plane. Reference is actually reference lines. So you just need to make sure you choose plane there if you want a regular reference plane. So it's going to draw a, a surface there or a plane. And it's really important here that you name them. If you want to use them, it makes it much easier if you give them a name. So in properties, I can select that um, reference plane and then in properties, uh, give it a name. So I'm just going to call this profile plane. And then back in my 3D view, I can use that now if I go to the draw tool and then I can choose that reference plane from the list there. And it will even show it to us. That doesn't look like... I put it, so just double check there if we actually drew that. Uh, level 2... Oh, no, sorry, okay, I'm looking back to front. So I meant to draw that over here, but that's the great thing about this approach. You can move the planes easily after you've created them, and the objects you draw on them will, uh, will go with the plane. So, again, back to the line tool, and now, again, I can make sure that plane's selected. And so I'll just draw a, a shape, actually. I'm just going to draw a rectangle and I might adjust it. So, in okay, so I can easily make that a bit more interesting, maybe dragging that line across just to get an angle or something, and maybe we'll make this one angled as well, and you can just trim those together. Oops. Okay, so now, to make that follow a curve, there are two approaches. If you just want to evolve it, you can draw another line to one side. So I'll draw a line over here. 
and that's going to be my axis. So it's not like the regular modeling tools. Revit will know if I select those two shapes and then use create form, it'll know that it's a revolve. So it bases the modeling operation on the, the kinds of objects you select. Uh, and so then using tab, I can select that element and then you've got the same options you have for evolve um, in terms of the angle that you use. So you might have it say 90 and uh, minus 90 or something. Oh, not 91, minus 90. Oh, it's not accepting negative angle, so I'm thinking of 3D max. So, uh, 270. Or maybe less than that. So, 180. Just to go quarter circle. So that's one approach if you wanted just to follow a uh, an arc. But, this is something you can't do with, very easily with regular solids. Uh, you can have... Well, sorry, this first thing you can. So, I can have a... Um, a path here, so I'm just going to draw, I'll do a spline from the uh, corner, but I'm also going to change the level back to uh, this size, so it's to roof this time, and oh, I better make sure, so I didn't check to see that my um, massing did actually relate to the, the roof level, I might have made it slightly different, oh, and of course I haven't changed my view cropping. Yeah, okay, so I've actually brought that up a little bit higher. Okay, so I'll just draw on the plane. That's all right. So, so here you can choose a level, but of course um, my level is a bit below that surface. So instead I'm just going to go back to this draw on face option and draw on the top of the massing that I've um, already made. And so I'm just going to do a spline type shape here. Got to be careful with the the way you do your curves because if you make them too tight, then it won't be able to create the geometry. So I can select that spline and then my shape, and then with create form, yep, I've gone to telling me I can't create it. Hopefully, it won't crash there. Okay, so that's to do with the curve and the nature of the geometry you'll create. So I'll uh, bring that spline around. No, as long as I don't select it, then it'll, it'll know it. So, yeah, the trick if you're using splines is to get the tangent of the um, curve to be perpendicular to the, um, the base, and then it will work, but to make it, to make sure, or to be sure that it's going to work, uh, you've got to, uh, you can sit down and, and work that out exactly, but usually you can get it visually just like I have there. So that'll make it follow any curve which could be interesting. Um, and then something, maybe I won't show you now, but you can actually do what's called a loft. So you can have several profiles along that, uh, that path and it will blend from one shape to the next. And so you can get much more complex geometry than with the, um, you know, the regular modelling tools in Revit. So, so there are lots of really interesting object creation methods that you have just using that one... Um, create form tool. Don't forget, you don't have to cre even create volumes. You can use it to create surfaces. So it always extrudes the surface perpendicular to the shape, so it's extruded this one sideways. Uh, so unlike regular solids, you don't have to extrude a closed shape. You can just create a single plane, and that can be useful to create interesting wall geometry. So if you have... I'll do one on the... Um, flat onto this surface, just to show you how useful that can be. Um, and it can be really... I'm going to do maybe a screen around the building afterwards and, and you'll see how useful it is there as well. So here, if I do just a zigzag line, it's open, so that wouldn't work if it was an extrusion. But here, it will extrude it, essentially, even though it's open. And then I can uh, do what I was showing you last time, select just a vertex on the corner, bring that down... We can get another one. Maybe we'll bring that out. Get a slope. And so just get sort of geometry that you just can't do with the regular modelling tools. And you can turn that into a wall. And windows and doors will go into it just fine. 
That's right. Oh, exactly, yeah, that's where it gets a bit tricky. So, and even yeah, getting a door. Yeah. So, um, you know, just think about it as an, an object, um, uh, you know, a modelling generation tool. Uh, so, you can, it's still really useful even just for basic block forms like this. Uh, but then you can even look at um, modifications to those. So, with those things I made just by extruding a um, rectangle, I might want to refine those shapes so I can, again, move an edge just to bring those back and uh, maybe look at ways I can experiment with the, the building form to get something different to what I started with. Uh, there, that's interesting because I used this surface to define that profile, that object is going to go with it. So you've got to sometimes think about the way you've done your modelling. But this side should be okay. If I slap that in, there we go. Right, so lots of different options there for modelling. And then uh, you can also use voids with these. So back to here. So I might have a, um, a setback entry on the, the ground floor. So I'll just go to that level. You can draw voids, or so draw your massing in any level or any view. And so here I'm going to go back to the draw on plane option and make sure I've got my level selected. And I'll just do a simple, again, simple shape, just a rectangle. Do the rest in the 3D view. Okay, so I can just select that, create form, and one option is to do it as a solid first. I do this pretty often actually. Uh, and then once you've got it right, so maybe I'd think, well, I want to bring that down a bit. I find it's just easier to adjust them while they're still uh, solids. And you might even just forget to make it a void as well. So it's really useful if you know that you can change any solid into a void. And then it will cut. Or, of course, you have the option just to yeah, go to void form from the beginning but it's much harder to change a void into a solid than it is to change a solid into a void. All right, so that can be really useful as a way of just firstly establishing the volumes of your different um, building sections, even just your levels, uh, but then also creating interesting geometry. So uh, I'll show you later how you can do some really interesting things with um, sunshades and things like that that wrap around the building. Um, but then uh, don't forget that now once you've uh, got some massing, you can use those to generate building components. So back to massing and site. You've got these options here for floors, walls, roofs, and so on. So starting with the um, main building, I can go to mass floors. Here actually I need to look at my existing levels. So these levels were just put in uh, roughly before and I can now maybe bring that roof level up to where I've got my mass. So taking the mass down to the level. And then I'll, this will be the, the parapet height probably for, the, uh, for that floor level in the end and then we'll have another roof for the, um, the roof terrace. Um, elements, so uh, I can always copy this level up there and we'll make a view for it later. And uh, so uh, terrace or something. and this will be well that's still going to be the roof for a large part of the building so I'll leave that as roof for now. So back to massing uh, also the 3D massing view and then with the um, mass selected, I can go to mass floors and simply tick the levels I want my floor plates to be made on. Don't worry about that message, that's okay. And then with the floor tool now, I can pick those floor plates. Oh, it's missed the roof. I've got to go and check the um, the mass there, so you can see there it didn't get that roof level, but it's got the other two, so that's fine. Let's go create floor. 
And then the wall tool. I might here go to, we'll do finish face exterior and we'll maybe look at refining the floors afterwards. So for now, they'll stick through, but it's all right. So with the, uh, the building surfaces there, you can just pick those. And I'll even make this a solid wall for now. Later that might be something else. And we'll just do the back and that one side, but uh, I'll leave the car park for now. And then you maybe see why that toggle is so useful, because I can toggle the massing off when I'm ready to continue working on just the building elements and, uh, and see what's there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can just bring it back. It's easy as well just to toggle that. So I can delete that wall and maybe if I decide to have a curtain wall there, instead I can go to curtain system and uh, switch that over. <coughs> and so then finally, the massing isn't, uh, isn't fixed. I can go, sorry, <coughs> go back to the massing now just by selecting it and going to edit in place. <coughs> and so maybe just as a simple example, I might want this, uh, this void to continue through to the level above, just as an example. So I'll select the void using tab, and then using tab again, I'm going to highlight the top plane of that void Using the, do you remember what red, green, and blue mean? Yeah, blue. Um, red is the X. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, y, green is the Y. Exactly. Blue is the Z. Exactly, exactly. Spot on. That's right. So that's a standard audience convention. So you know that when you go to 3ds Max, it's exactly the same. <coughs> so when you click on the, click and J just on the blue arrow, you know you're going up. And uh, you can actually do two at a time. So you can go. X and, and Z, for example. So it's like SketchUp. It is, a lot like that, yep. They actually, a lot of people say they brought the massing tools out as a response to people using SketchUp. Uh, so I could have this sloping. It might be interesting to have a sloping void. There we go. So, finish mass, and I can go back now and update my building elements. So I can select the floors, update to face, and that's going to follow the changes I've made to the mass. The walls, same thing, update to face, and it will again take on those changes. Oh, that's a bit weird. I've never seen that happen before. Okay, if that happens, maybe it's best just to make it again. It should update. I've never seen that happen before, actually. It's always updated perfectly. But easy if you have to, just to make a new... Oh, it's because it's split over two, two solids, that's why. Yeah, so uh, you can easily have your um, building elements follow your changes to massing, and uh, so that way you can keep experimenting with the mass form um, if you want to, and then have the other things follow. So hopefully that'll give you some ideas about how you can start generating the volume of your building, starting with a, um, so I'll just go back to show the massing only. You can almost think of this as a master plan, and if you want to, you can get different um, colours for the massing, and uh, I'll show you, there's some really good um, things you're about to see online, if you just do a search for um, architectural massing, so these aren't all done with Revit, I think a lot would be, but this is just a general um, approach. And so these are really nice views that you can create that show the uh, breakup of the um, the building, the building mass forms, and, uh, and you can easily use use Revit to do those with the massing tools. So the last thing, I'll, very last thing, I'll show you there. I select one of those, edit in place. Make sure you're confident using Tab to toggle between the different selection options so that you can get the entire element, which I've got there. And then you can set a material to these, just like anything else. So there are mass materials. 
if you can scroll down, there are these default mass materials. And they're a good starting point, as good as any. So I'm going to duplicate this, and we'll call this maybe mass um, entry. It's entry in offices, but the entry level. And it's already got a transparency set, so I'm just going to change the colour to something different. Okay, so that way you can, you know, clearly indicate those different zones and do, hopefully, you know, a nice massing diagram. You can, and that's always set up there along with your other views. Okay, so the massing disappeared because I finished working on it and the toggle was off, but I can even toggle that back on. So, is there anything else you're not sure about with massing or...? Yep, okay, so that, yep. And you've got, don't forget, you've got that reference um, that I gave you as well, that, that couple of chapters that go through a lot more detail. How are you getting this video? Oh, of course, yeah, I'm going to put it on YouTube and I'll give you a link to it oh. in a minute. Yeah. Ah, somehow I've got two recordings going at once. I wonder how I did that. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So just make sure you email me a PDF if you can't get into Moodle. If you can do it through Moodle, that's good. Okay. But if you, if you can't, just email me. No, so we have to come in. So I better just do a roll for you as well.